Zoomer Life. Health, wellness, and longevity from the world's brightest minds. Alex, you like to work from the chair on the table. And by the way, uh, and if you have a minute, you've got to come and try out these new steel case wonders. They're just <laughs> fabulous. They're very cool, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Alex. He's a great, good pal, uh, longtime pal, and uh, a famous medical reprobate. He's uh, proud to tell you he's been thrown out of some of the best medical schools on the planet. <laughs> um, and um, he's a radical innovator in deep dimensional body imaging. In other words, he's not a doctor. He's an artist, he's a photographer, and uh, a technologist who has done visionary work. Um, He's an expert in human anatomy and uh, has a passion for the female, f no, sorry. He has a passion for the <laughs> no, you're, human you're, form. You're right on. For the human form. <laughs> right. So his, his company, which is unique in the world, um, their specialty is visually rich health content, made real and effective. Not as hard to comprehend science described in Latin words, but in compelling human stories brought to life using brilliant 3D visualizations based on actual human data. Like, once upon a time, wasn't there a prisoner who got freeze-dried, a dead prisoner provided by the government of the United States? Right. Texas. In Texas, in right, and he was sort of sliced one micron at a time, and you photographed that the data? We actually acquired the data. We were on the NIH board. Basically, it was sliced into one millimeter slices, 1,870 odd slices in, in one millimeter. And so basically what happens is that we then get the data and uh, we recompile it. So you've got gigabytes and gigabytes of data of a single person and went on to do a man. And that's how Chinese you, have done even more and more. You do that, that kind of fly through the human body. Well, there's only one, that's only one of thousands of data sets that we have right now. And that's will be one of the things that we'll be talking about is, is being able to get more data to understand the body from the small to the large. Right, so with, with all this richness in hand, uh, Alex could uh, talk to you about a, a variety of illnesses, virtually any illness, but I've asked him here to deal with diabetes and Alzheimer's, that's two diseases, and accordingly, I've allowed him an unprecedented 25 minutes. Thank Alex Ciaras. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little background. It's true, uh, I was thrown out of seven universities, so I don't even have a university degree. But unusually, uh, I went on to teach myself uh, mathematics, advanced math, and then physics and advanced physics. And um, I was offered a position uh, as associate professor and chief of scientific visualization at Yale where I was uh, writing most of the algorithms and code for NASA to do virtual surgery in preparation for the astronauts going into deep space flight so they could be cut in robotic pods from a distance. So our goal was to basically be able to look at beautiful new data sets from new scanners so that you could see them in a way that they had never been seen before. And that, that research and that work was very successful, but I felt that it was, it was better to take this and create a separate company where we could actually really explore uh, more of these kinds of applications and in everyday life. So I went to New York City and created the Visual MD. And we are made up of technologists, scientists, physicians, artists, and storytellers. We have the obligatory, you know, 150 terabytes of hard disk space, disk space applied to every project we have. Uh, everyone has numerous supercomputers near their desk. We have proprietary algorithms and software. It's the kind of the, you know, the geek kingdom, you know, uh, of Nirvana. But the thing is that what we've been doing over the past 20 years, we've been acquiring data. We have every piece of data from the smallest cell from the day you're born until the day you die, from the molecular structure all the way up to the gross anatomy. And the thing is that what we realize in this multiplicity of data is that our data is relatively soulless. It is just a series of X, Y, Z coordinates in abstract space. And we sit there saying, in order for us to give it a soul, it has to have a story. It's, it's story that gives soul to data. And therefore, what we do is we take every one of these data sets that we do indeed love because we are technologists, and we try to figure out how can we indeed 
bring this back to what it is, someone's mother, someone's father, someone's brother, someone's sister, someone that is important to you so that you actually understand the importance of the technology and the importance of the drama of what's going on inside your body. So I'll give you a, uh, an example of a story. Here we have a, a story of, of chronic kidney disease. Here's a lovely man in Indiana who basically has a, a thousand acre farm. He wants to live to see his grandchildren grow up, but basically he has uh, uh, advanced stage chronic kidney disease. Scanning the kidneys, here he has a st stage five. And what happens is that when you have chronic kidney disease, you, you're producing almost no erythropoietin, which is actually making more red blood cells, so you lose your vitality, you end up with anemia. Fortunately, his son-in-law had a perfect match. And so he was going to get a, a transplant and it was gonna give him his life back. In this, what we noticed is that we started coming up with new technologies. We worked with a number of universities and, and geneticists working with a Winstar München mouse, which had a, uh, the ability to actually have what they call glomeruli. These are glomeruli. You have millions of them in each one of your kidneys that are basically filtering your, your, all the fluids going through your body. And here, what happened is that we had one where you could see was perfectly normal, and it's robust and like a beautiful raspberry. And here, it looks like it's in an ashtray, and, and, and this is the son-in-laws, and this is the, the equivalent of the, of the um, man who has uh, chronic kidney disease. And these conditions are directly related to smoking, all the things we've been talking about today, lifestyle-related diseases, which I'm going to concentrate on today, obesity, diabetes, type 2. Now, a lot of people say to us, you know, what is, do, do you do this visualization for the professional community? But the beauty of this is, though, though we did this for the, uh, a big meeting at the American Nephrology meeting, the beauty of visualization is that you get it. It gives you what we call that holy shit, I finally get it moment. <laughs> and that, that epiphany is a very big deal, which I'm going to come back to in a moment. The, then what happened is that we actually did the virtual surgery in advance, uh, though it's a quite a common uh, surgical performance. Uh, and what happens here is it's sort of an unusual operation because maybe your kidneys are still producing a little bit of your erythropoietin, and so you put this in the false pelvis, and you actually end up with uh, three kidneys. And uh, here he is now, uh, well again, though he's on medication, uh, immunosuppressants, and he has his three kidneys walking down the fields with his son with one kidney. Now, the beauty of uh, this story is that, you know, here we are talking about technologies, using two photon microns to actually scan the glomeruli and wind mice and, you know, supercomputers. But after we finished this, one of the things that I was flabbergasted by is that this is a totally preventable disease. No one ever talked about prevention. Everyone talked about dialysis. Everyone talked about transplantation. Everyone talked about end disease management. And it finally got me thinking, this is a terrible term, disease management. It's like taking care of a rabid dog. Who wants disease management? People don't want to manage the disease. What they want back is they want to be healed. They want their health and they want their vitality. So we said, we're going to stop this and we're going to actually refocus our technologies and our storytelling capabilities. And we're going to refocus it to the point where we're sitting here saying, let's look at the kidney where we should have started, flushing it out. The chronic kidney disease that you saw is principally created by hypertension and diabetes type 2, preventable diseases in most cases. And so what we did is we started to say, okay, as we have the ability to tell stories, let's go back and see if we can create the tool set of wellness that can be applied to every lifestyle-related disease and give people back their health and their vitality. And what we did is try to treat every one of our diseases, and I'm sorry, every one of our rules with the same kind of respect that we treat the body. So here, what we did is that we, here's a, uh, an orange, for example. We scanned every piece of fruit and vegetable so that we could actually break it down when we're telling you nutrition stories to tell you why are you eating that piece of fruit? Why are you eating that vegetable? Why are you eating that high fiber? What is it about those fats that are either good for your body or bad for your body? We wanted to show you how this is going to be deconstructed to make this. We gathered over 100 key opinion leaders in the country, and what we did is we found that people had extraordinary research done in this area, but they were basically siloed, and the, even the silos were splintered. So here's a magnificent image of an inside of a bone, and you would think that this is actually an osteoporotic bone. It is both an osteoporotic bone and is actually the bone of a, of a three-year-old child with not enough vitamin D. And what happens is the same things. If you do not have the proper nutrients, your body will not grow. 
We have so many nutritional problems in the way that we basically in, input our food. And these, what we wanted to do is document the evidence of every one of these. At the same time, what happens to our body when we overeat? We wanted to visualize so that you would really understand, rather than people just saying, don't overeat, and your stomach gets bigger, you know, and, and then you, know, you get used to it. Well, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that you have these nerves that come down, they're called the, the, the vagus nerve, the, the 10th cranial nerves that come down from your neck. And basically, it comes down and it innervates your stomach. And when your stomach actually expands, it tells you, hey, I'm, you know, I'm big enough now. Once it starts to get to two liters, it's so big, it loses communication, and all of a sudden, you do not know how to speak to your brain. The stomach is just in the sense of the neuron, never mind when you're talking about the, the nutritional. And when we started to look at how much can the stomach hold, little stories. We love the stories. You know, when you're born one or two days, your stomach is the size of a chickpea. Three days, six days, the size of a grape. One week later, it's the size of a strawberry. A week later, I mean, six months to one year, it's a grapefruit, and then it becomes the size of a cantaloupe. These are the kinds of gradations of the size that your stomach goes through, and these are the kinds of things that we have to respect, that we maintain, that will allow us to maintain our lifestyles and the vitality. Now, when we talk about vitality, here's a very interesting kind of molecule that was discovered. It's called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's called miracle grow for the brain. And one of the principal ingredients that makes it to create new neurons or to create what they call neurogenesis or synaptogenesis to optimize learning is exercise. Just go out and exercise. Anaerobic exercise is here and is the thing that produces this one molecule that just simply makes you or your children smarter. Another part that we wanted to just sort of like go into identify is why, why must I do anaerobic exercise? We wanted to visualize and give you understanding so that when your trainer says, oh, you, you need to build muscle, what are you? Well, you've got to be stronger. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. Here is a piece of fat, okay? This is the, the, the nucleus of the fat. And in, in that, you have almost no mitochondria. These are the mitochondria here, these little blue objects. Mitochondria are the furnaces inside your cell that basically burn off all the foods, the, the, you know, the lipoproteins, basically the fatty acids, I'm sorry, and, and your glucose. Now, inside this fat cell, as you see, there are many, and inside, I mean, inside this muscle, so you see there are many. Inside this fat cell, you see there are none, or very few. You have a thousand times more mitochondria in a, fat, in a muscle cell than you do in a fat cell. That's 10 to the third power. Now, you gain a pound of muscle, and you have a furnace just burning off foods that you're eating. And this is why when, you, when people are saying, you know, lose weight, but make sure that you don't lose the muscle. When people are talking to you about your basal metabolic rate, what is a basal metabolic rate? It doesn't mean anything until all of a sudden you see this is what your basal metabolic rate is all about. The muscle inside your body, the, these cells are burning these objects. These mitochondria are burning them. And the more you have that muscle, the more you basically, any food source while you're sleeping are just going to be burnt off simultaneously. Now, when we get into, uh, as they were discussing stress this morning, the biggest problem is it's not stress. Stress is actually good. You need to stress your muscle. You need to stress your brain. The biggest problem that we have today is chronic stress, chronic stress and depression. We did a project with the Dean of Neurobiology at Mount Sinai University, and what we did is we scanned the highest resolution neurons ever created. Now, this is a neuron, and these are dendritic ends. You see how they're melting by about 30%? That's chronic stress, basically, just basically eroding your brain from cortical steroids that are constantly pumping inside your body. I mean, the brain is only one of the things that are affected. As you can see here, you multiply times the entire brain, the brain just shrinks this part here, you know, the gray matter that everyone's always talking about, just basically shrinks down, the outer components fill with water, and you end up losing a tremendous amount of mental power. This is from cortical steroids dependent on chronic stress, of which we are a part of every day. These are the things that we wanted to look at from a lifestyle perspective that we can control. We wanted to identify and show you through simple stories. Let me give you a little video here. We measure a lot of biomarkers because we want to know what someone's health status is. And we also want to have something to track uh, because there are things that as we track these over time, we can get a good index of someone's overall health. Um, a good example of that is the level of inflammation in the blood. 
The biomarker that measures inflammation in the blood is called the C-reactive protein, and the average range is between 1 and 3. People have obesity, they also have more inflammation, especially people with excess fat in the abdominal area, the apple-shaped people. They basically carry a factory for inflammation in their belly that's actively producing all kinds of molecules that cause inflammation. This is because all fat cells are not created equal. Fat cells in obese people are actually made up differently than fat cells in lean people. In obese people, fat cells are surrounded by hungry white blood cells called mast cells. The mast cells eat the fatty acids and the fat cells' insides, or cytoplasms. They become bloated or foamy, garnering the name foam cells. Foam cells are related to atherosclerosis and heart disease. When people have chronic inflammation all the time, that kind of inflammation has been shown to contribute to all host of chronic diseases from Alzheimer's dementia to heart disease to cancer uh, to degeneration of the brain. And um, we can really do a lot to minimize the chronic inflammation. So if somebody has inflammation because they're carrying around 15 extra pounds and they're not getting to the gym, the solution's easy. We've got to get them working out, dropping a little bit of weight. We see that C-reactive protein level come down. And what that means is they're at less risk for heart attack, for stroke, for diabetes, for cancer. So it's very important to track that level of inflammation because it tells us what the overall health of the individual is. So as we continued to study this, we started to recognize, okay, now we know, we know the rules of the game. We actually have seen the biology at the molecular, at the, at the cellular tissue level, all the way up, the organ level, all the way up to the full system. So we started to write these protocols to actually take people through a four-month program to see if we could get them off their meds, if we could actually heal them. And what we did is that we put them in scanners, we raised millions and millions of dollars to actually build these stories and try to figure out what was working and what wasn't. This person that we put through, we scanned their entire body. And take a look at what happens when he was obese. You see his lung here? See, there's no room for him to breathe. And you see how it expands afterwards. That fat just compresses. It, the, 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 the visceral fat in here is a, it become, you know, cytokines. It, it's an inflammatory, it becomes an endocrine. It becomes very, very dangerous. In four months, this person was entirely off his meds. We put a number of people through these programs, and then what we wanted to do is sit there saying, okay, we now have the stories, we now have the understanding. But the problem is, it's very difficult to get people to comply. You know, you have pharmaceutical companies and physicians, you know, spending billions of dollars in marketing trying to get, you know, patients to comply with their drugs. You have uh, dietitians and nutritionists trying to get people to comply with their, you know, their, their diet programs. You have physical trainers trying to get people to do, comply with their exercise. It's the 900-pound gorilla. How do you get someone to comply? Well, the problem is that people do not comply through obligation. Do it because I say it's good for you. They just don't do it. And the billions of dollars are wasted. So we said we need to create people are People comply because they're inspired. But the problem is, I can tell you a story that can inspire you to start a program, but I can't keep you on the program. That's the biggest problem. Until I make you the story of your own inspiration. So what we did is said, having the greatest content in the category of wellness and explaining to people, I need to give you tools to tell the story of yourself. But to tell the story means you have to start with actually combining four big businesses that are siloed and splintered. The first one is the personal health record or the electronic medical record. The second one is content. The third are wellness programs, and the fourth is the ability to share it and be accountable to it. So in the first one, what we did is we built it down so that you can get your lab reports, which we are making very differently than most of these personal health records, which are at the tail end is a storage unit for what's going on inside your body. We're making it the beginning of your journey and your pathway back to health. You have all your lab reports here, but rather than just having lab reports, we keep a history very simply. I mean, you actually keep it. And here's a person that we took through the first four months. Here are his lab reports. He had diabetes type 2. His glucose was normal at the end of four months, but when he wants to look at his trends, he looked at it over months, and he saw at the beginning his numbers were actually very high. So he can actually go back and take a look at the history of his, and here, when he was high, you can actually go back and see what was, you know, I want to learn more. What's going on? So one of the first things we wanted to do was to actually demystify lab reports. 
lab reports are like hieroglyphics and only the physio, my doctor, knows. No, there's no reason you shouldn't know. It's a very simple story of what glucose or A1C, these are lovely little stories about what's going on inside your body and what parts of your body are producing it, are, are suffering it, are needing it. And we told little stories of what's happening inside the body. In these kinds of stories, we felt we're gonna be the first thing to really help you understand and take control. Now, on the other end, if you're on the low end of glucose, you're gonna have other conditions on the high end. So every biomarker, every lab report is broken down into a beautiful little story to tell you. But if you're flagged, it will also tell you stories that you should actually go take a look at, like you might have diabetes type two. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a more elongated story about diabetes type two. The trends here are truly ominous. The CDC recently published a report indicating that should current trends persist, by 2050 or thereabouts, as many as one in three Americans will have diabetes. I don't really understand what hope we have of dealing with the national economy if one in three of us is diabetic. Currently, more than 23 million Americans suffer from diabetes, and an additional 57 million are pre-diabetic, with a high risk for developing the disease. 90% of those with diabetes have type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes goes hand in hand with the epidemic of obesity, although you don't have to be obese to have type 2 diabetes. And one of the first things we think happens is people become resistant to insulin. Insulin is a hormone made and released by the pancreas, a fish-shaped organ about 10 inches long that lies behind your stomach. Insulin's main function is to regulate blood sugar throughout every cell of your body. The tissues, cells, metabolically active cells like muscle and brain and heart have receptors for insulin. And insulin is the hormone that's involved in allowing glucose to go from the bloodstream inside the cell to get processed for energy. And in insulin resistance, that process is very inefficient and it doesn't work very well. When insulin can't move glucose into the cells, the glucose stays in your bloodstream, raising your blood sugar level. Then your pancreas makes more insulin to compensate for the extra blood sugar. High levels of insulin in turn shifts us more towards storing calories around our midsection. And it turns out that this fat around our midsection, what we call the visceral adipose tissue or VAT, is secreting other molecules, cytokines that modulate inflammation, um, hormones that influence our sensitivity to insulin. And it becomes a vicious cycle. Symptoms for diabetes can often go unnoticed and can include excessive thirst, frequent urination, fatigue, blurred vision, and tingling or burning in the extremities. People who are overweight, particularly with a waistline above 40 inches in men and 35 in women, or have a family history, have a high risk for developing type 2 diabetes. These people, and anyone over the age of 45, should be tested. The most common test for diabetes is the FPG, or fasting plasma glucose, which is a blood test taken after you haven't eaten for eight hours. The normal range is between 70 and 100. People with consistent readings over 125 are considered to be diabetic. The other common blood test is called the hemoglobin A1C. This hemoglobin A1C, do you remember what that means? You know what that's about? No. So hemoglobin A1C is this blood test that, that gives us a, basically an overview of how good your sugar control has been over the past couple of months. Okay. okay. So the blood sugar gives us instantaneously what your sugar is right when we draw it, and this gives us sort of a two or three month view. Okay, so it's a more stable estimate. The normal number is less than six. <laughs> I'm nowhere near that. You're nowhere near that. You know, one thing about diabetes is, is that it accelerates aging in every organ of the body. In fact, it's a great model for studying aging. A diabetic is going to age more quickly. Excess sugar in the bloodstream has a toxic effect on your body, mostly by damaging large and small blood vessels, which often leads to cardiovascular disease, heart attack, 
stroke, high blood pressure, blindness, and gangrene in the extremities. Diabetes is also the leading cause of chronic kidney disease in the U.S. If we could control our risk for diabetes, if we can control our weight, if we can control what we eat, we can reduce the risk of diabetes and slow the aging process. So little stories that explain to you along the way, along your path, things that are going on inside your body, what's happening. The idea that you want to basically find out, you know, every aspect, these stories are then delivered to you at the time of your need when you're flagged. Okay, so now I know my numbers, I understand my numbers. Now I've been told what the consequences are. What do I want to do? I want to do something about it. So I can get on a program where basically every part of the nutrition information that I was showing you earlier can be shared where I can actually use this to plan my meals. I can actually have what we are bringing together called vitality guides. It may be your nutritionist, it may be a uh, physician, it may be a nurse, it may be your trainer. They can get on and give you information about what's going on. They can help you plan your meals. They can help you plan your exercise. A simple, elegant way to map out your day of everything that you're going to do in relationship to how am I going to plan, not only plan my meals, but what is the, how is the meal going to be tracked. Information is going to be provided at time of need again. Plus, they're going to provide you with this kind of information, feeding you uh, uh, videos, conversations, a simple, elegant way to talk to somebody else. It could be a friend. You may want to do it on your own, so the information will be delivered to you. As we learn more about you, the thing is that we'll be able to give you better information. Uh, for example, if you're having prostate cancer surgery, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to suggest doing you know, bicycle training. I'm going to give you appropriate type of uh, exercises to do that are going to be in relationship to your needs, the type of foods. Maybe you eat kosher. I'm not going to give you the foods that are you know, not good for diabetics. This kind of information is going to be fed to me. The diet and the vitality guide is going to come to me and say, these are kinds of pieces of information which will be valuable for you to see and to understand. They're going to teach you along the way. When you exercise, your body's cells absorb glucose as fuel. If you suffer from diabetes, your cells cannot absorb adequate glucose. But when you exercise, your cells can absorb up to 20 times more glucose than they can normally. This lowers blood sugar levels and helps manage diabetes while keeping weight under control. Exercise plays a key role. When tissues are exercised, it enhances insulin sensitivity, it helps us build our metabolically active tissues. It really is one of the mainstays. 30 minutes of exercise five times a week, boosting dietary fiber, cutting saturated fat was compared to diabetes medications. The lifestyle was superior in terms of preventing progression. So the reality is that most medical problems, including largely the chronic lifestyle illnesses, which is what obesity leads to, like hypertension and diabetes, can be reversed with weight loss. And if people would focus on those things, they can virtually eliminate most of the chronic lifestyle diseases. So you go back and you say, I can now have a guide who's giving me information that is in my library, that is pertinent to me. But I now want to keep a digital diary of what's happening inside my body. Uh, what we wanted to do was transform social media as we understood it today. You can now not only upload all of your own information, but you can upload the largest visual library in the world from us. When you see something that helps you to understand it, you can actually pull it in, annotate it, and bring it into your, to your own storyline. So you can share with friends of yours the epiphany of when you had a moment. And it's amazing how even though our library is our library, the moment we learned from Duchamp painting of the mustache on the Mona Lisa, all of a sudden it became his from the Dada movement. The same thing, we're using exactly that same kind of example here to allow them to take the the epiphanies of moment, when they understood what was going on inside their body, to share that so that basically at the end of four months, when they have actually gone through their pathway back to health, they can keep a lovely little library here that allows you, them to tell the story of their pathway back pictorially so that they can share with their friends, make a, push a button, it becomes a little YouTube video of their pathway back to health. Now, What's happening here is that we're not naive. 15% of the population wants to change, maybe about 25%, maybe another 5 to 10% sitting on the fence. But the thing is that we cannot overpromise. We're sitting here saying there are continuums. 
But quality of life in the cardiovascular continuums, when you quantify it, the day you're born, you're given this pristine cardiovascular system and this supple 60,000 miles of vessels through your body. You're going to age. But here at 75, you're going to be able to run a triathlon. And here, your life will be tremendously compromised. You will be crippled or dead. And the thing is that these behaviors, what we wanted to do was build a tool set and content that would allow you to tell the story of you. And if we can succeed with this, with the exception of vaccine, we feel that it will be one of the most powerful tools ever created in the category of health and wellness. We thank you. Alex, I want a picture with you. I have to give us a proverbial kiss. That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, oh, Oop, thank yeah. You. Thank you. I, I'm just thunderstruck by the, first of all, the artistry of, of, of the work that you do and, and the meticulous nature in which you've drafted a pathway for those of us who really want to knuckle down and do something about it. It's, it's an amazing breakthrough, and I congratulate you. Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.